Hello everyone, this is going to be chapter 20 on the lymphatic system and immunity, uh, and this is part one. Part two is going to be uh, adaptive immunity. Um, I'm going to cover everything before for this one. Um, so let's talk about the structure and function of the lymphatic system. Um, the immune and lymphatic systems work together, um, and that's known as you know the, the immune system basically. And it's there to protect us from injury, as well as any disease-causing agent, including cells uh, and viruses as well. Uh, again, we try to protect from the internal and external threats. Uh, so it's not really a system of organs. Um, so this is really at the tissue level. Um, and we deal with things like leukocytes, uh, different types of white blood cells, as well as different uh, proteins in the plasma, uh, which is found in the circulatory system. Uh, the lymphatic system is basically a collection of, of tissues and just a couple organs um, that help maintain fluid homeostasis in the body as well as um, help with the development and maturation of um, some type of uh, white blood cells. Um, so this lymphatic system is made of the vessels, uh, which are basically uh, blind in the tubes. And some of these tubes are going to go into your circulatory system to help maintain uh, fluid balance. Um, you also have a couple of uh, different tissues and, and organs, which are follicles, uh, things like the tonsils, nodes, the spleen, and the thymus as well. Again, this one kind of really important for the maturation of, uh, of some of those white blood cells. Uh, and that's T cells to be more specific. Uh, the lymphatic system helps regulate interstitial fluid um, by basically uh, allowing the um, the pressure in the blood capillaries to filter um, out some of the fluid. So basically about two to four liters per day uh, you lose of plasma. Um, so it's either going to get lost and excreted or it's going to be returned into circulation. Uh, again, if you lose too much of this fluid, uh, you're going to have a low blood volume. And as you remember, blood volume and blood pressure are uh, directly proportional. So if you lose too much blood volume, that means that your blood pressure gets really, really low as well. Um, this system, the lymphatic vessels, are going to pick up some of that fluid and they're going to transport throughout the body. And usually they deliver to the cardiovascular system, uh, more specifically going into the right side of the heart. Um, the absorption of some dietary fats that you have, uh, it's... Well, you, you have different centers of, absor of absorption and integration into the lymphatic system. This one just happens to be in the small intestines. Um, so again, this is where they, they're kind of taken in. Um, you have these little uh, vesicles called the lacteals, and these are in your uh, small intestines, and they help take some of that and deliver it to the rest of your system. In terms of immune function, they're really important for filtering any pathogens that you may have in your limb for your blood as well as the development of certain types of leukocytes. Again, we're talking about the T helper cells and cytotoxic T cells. Um, and these are basically called T cells because they mature in the thymus. Again, that's where that T is coming from. So here we have an image of the body with some of the vessels and some of the organs. So again, you have tonsils right there. You have the thymus right here, spleen, and then you have a ton of nodes everywhere. Uh, some of these lymphatic vessels are going to come in and they're going to form these uh, lymph trunks. And there's a few of them in the body. So the lumbar is the one that's coming from the limbs and pelvic area. The jugular is going to come from the head and neck. The intestinal is going to be coming from the small intestine, of course, and the bronchomediastinal is going to come from the thoracic cavity. You have a couple others, like the subclavian, which is coming from the upper limbs. Uh, some of the circulation patterns in the lymphatic vessels are not always symmetrical. Uh, so, for example, on the left side and all of the lower body, you have the cisterna chile, which is basically where most of the things drain off on. Um, again, it's, it's the biggest duct that, that you have, the thoracic duct. So this is kind of where all of this is draining. Again, all of the lower body and the left side of the upper body and the right side, it basically all drains 
um, or the remaining parts drain into the right lymphatic duct, which um, it's going to drain into the junction of the internal jugular and the um, right subclavian. So again, this is what we have. And of course, all of this is draining um, and going into the left subclavian vein, which is going to go and feed into the right side of the heart. And then, of course, uh, all this is fluid, by the way. This is what we're, we're talking about. Some of the fluids that were removed uh, end up making back into your, or end up making their way back into your circulatory system. And again, here we see an image of what that looks like. Again, just to, to make sure it, it's not symmetrical. There's no uh, even distribution of the of the elements that are taken out of the blood. It's all kind of going to go um, to a different place. Uh, again, they're typically low pressure. There's no pumps in the lymphatic system. Um, most of this stuff is going uh, against gravity. Um, there is some muscle contraction that's found um, in some of these areas, but again, there's no specialized pump for these. Um, these lymphatic vessels, they're going to basically start with little capillaries and then they're going to form beds that are going to go through and around the capillary beds. And here it's some of the, some of the places where they're going to start moving, you know, away from the tissues. It's really, um, uh, where capillaries are, are two way systems. So not only are they taking stuff to the tissues, they're also bringing it back. Um, again, they're not necessarily very tight. Um, so there's, there's a lot of leakage here. Um, and again, most of it, or, well, I guess some of the fluid that, that leaves those capillaries goes into the interstitial fluid. And, you know, from here, it kind of, uh, enters the, the capillaries of the lymphatic system. And then it starts making its way, um, through the lymphatic system. Lymph nodes are kind of the, the filters of the lymphatic system. So, you know, things like bacteria and small things, they have a really hard time, um, getting through the, the blood barrier. So they, they actually go into the lymphatic uh, vessels are a little bit easier than they do than blood. So as they're going through that, uh, they run into a node and that node basically acts like a filter. So it's about 90% of the stuff that uh, enters your body. That's a pathogen or a bacterium. It gets filtered through there. Again, their job is basically to limit the spread. It's, it's trying to prevent uh, these things from going into circulation. Uh, again, here we see the capillary beds and how the, you have uh, lymphatic capillaries kind of going in through and around those capillary beds. Again, they're really important because they're also a delivery system um, for macrophages that are trying to get out of the, the tissues. Uh, not only that, but they're also really important for getting some of that interstitial fluid that's been leaking from those capillaries um, into the lymphatic system, just to try to help and maintain that uh, homeostasis. Um, whenever you have issues with um, the interstitial fluid um, making its way into the lymphatic system, you tend to develop something called a lymphedema. Um, so basically it's the swelling or the edema of your lymphs or lymph nodes. Um, again, this is really common with people that have um, uh, different types of trauma or disease and, uh, or even cancers in some cases that you have to remove, um, parts and, um, tissues sometimes. So when you do this, sometimes you also remove, um, the pathways that that interstitial fluid used to get out of that area and go into this, into the circulation. And, um, if you do that, that tends to disrupt, um, the homeostatic balance in that region. So um, here we have a patient that had, I think, um, she had surgery. So in, after they removed, um, whatever it is they were removing, um, that lack of vessels to get the fluid out ended up, um, leading to that severe, uh, swelling of the, of the arm in this case. Um, I guess that's really it for this one. Um, there's a lot of loose connective tissue called reticular tissue that um, its main job is to act kind of like a net. So 
this reticular tissue is lymphoid tissue and it's found in the lymphoid organs. Uh, again, those are the little clusters that we talked about that help filter out some of these pathogens. Um, in some of the organs, you have a lot of different types of cells and some of those include leukocytes. So some of the leukocytes that you can find are macrophages, mainly uh, monocytes. Uh, you can find B and T lymphocytes. So those are agranulocytes. Again, they don't have any granules that serve a bunch of different types of functions. Uh, you have dendritic cells and you also have reticular cells. Again, dendritic cells are kind of your, um, these guys usually go in there first. So those are the um, first cells to become antigen presenting cells. Um, and that's really important. So again, something foreign comes into your body. Uh, the first thing that gets them is whoever's in the area. And again, those cells are the first to become antigen presenting cells. And once they become activated as antigen presenting cells, they start recruiting other cells to do a bunch of different things. And then you have your second responders, and that's when you have uh, adaptive immunity come into the picture. But again, right now, we're just really talking about the, uh, the cell types and things like that. We'll discuss that in the next lecture. Again, here you just see a collection of, um, of these cells in that little network. Okay, not only do you have um, some of those leukocytes found in that tissue, you also have uh, some of those white blood cells in the mucosa layers throughout your body. So those are known as the malt um, tissues or, or they're, they're released from the malt. So the mucosa associated lymphatic tissue is again, really, really loose. Um, it protects the mucous membranes. And again, you also have a source of white blood cells in that malt. Um, it usually lines your oral nasal cavities, your GI tract, and some of your respiratory passages. Um, and again, most of it is really B and T cells that, again, they don't have uh, any type of connective tissue or, or a capsule. They're just kind of very loosely organized. Um, you have a lot more of that um, tissue in places like your tonsils. So you have uh, several different types of tonsils uh, that I'll talk about in a little bit. You also have these things called the pyrus patches. Um, and again, these are typically found in the small intestine. And then of course your appendix. So you have pharyngeal tonsils. These are typically towards the posterior uh, of your nasal cavity. You also have the palatine tonsils, which are po uh, posterior lateral. So those are the ones that, you know, whenever you're, you're feeling a little bit sick or started coughing and then your mom or your grandma or your tia was like, okay, open up or something like that. Well, that's what they're talking about. Um, and then you also have your lingual tonsils, which are at the base of the, uh, of the back of the tongue. So you have quite a few of them. And again, their main role is to identify um, and protect. Again, they're, they survey basically what's coming into your body. And if one of those things contains pathogens, the white blood cells there and the dendritic cells there are responsible for telling the body, hey, we have this invader, it's time to mount a response. And if they don't mount a response and it can be taken care of by any of the cells that are there, then uh, even better. Again, that's the, one of the first lines of defense. Uh, there's the epithelium that lines these tonsils. So there's uh, these little tonsillar crypts, which are basically traps for bacteria and debris. So again, usually when you have um, uh, tonsillitis or any other condition, with inflamed tonsils, sometimes it's because those traps are filled with uh, pus. And what pus is, it's a collection of white blood cells that have been uh, killing things. And sometimes it's food and bacterial cells. So what they do is they basically decompose everything. And then you create this little uh, um, cyst almost. And then sometimes when, you know, the air is really dry and, you know, there's a a cracking to the to the tonsils those things are going to get released and sometimes you know they uh, come out when you cough or when you spit um, but in most cases sometimes they're, they're they're swallowed again here you have the pharyngeal tonsil so uh, sometimes you feel like a little burning itching sensation on the roof of your mouth and the soft palate that's the pharyngeal tonsil um, and then you have the palatine tonsils which are uh, towards the sides and then you have the lingual tonsils uh, towards the back of that tongue. Uh, pyrus patches, 
these are actually a, kind of like a fail safe. So if you have something coming out or escaping the large intestine, these things are supposed to catch them. Um, and then of course the appendix, um, this is anything that, uh, or any bacterium or pathogens that are detected in your large intestine, they typically end up there. Uh, and again, just really, really quick. It's specifically those that could be pathogenic. There are tons of bacteria that live in your intestines that help uh, break down food and provide you with uh, with some of those nutrients and even vitamins in some cases. Um, and again, your body does not attack those. It only attacks those that could be pathogenic. So again, here we have some of the regions of where those, uh, those were found. And again, just so you know, your entire body has uh, mucus everywhere. You have uh, that protective layer all around you. Uh, lymph nodes, of course, um, they're found throughout the body. They're again just clusters of those uh, um, of those tissues. You have axillary lymph nodes, um, which are found in in your armpits. You have the cervical ones, which are found in your neck, um, inguinal, which are in the groin area, and then you have the mesenteric, which are found in your abdominal cavity. Um, again, they do have connective tissue. They form this little capsule. Um, and there's really two regions to this capsule. You have the cortex, which is on the outside, like just about everything that has cortex. Um, and then you also have the medulla, which is towards the inside. Uh, the cortex is mainly a ton of B cells um, that form these little capsules known as the trabeculae. You also have um, a dark zone in between the cortex and the medulla, which is uh, primarily composed of D cells, making it just a little bit darker. Um, and then you also have the medulla, which is a bunch of macrophages and B cells. And again, I know right now we haven't talked too much about B cells, but we will be going into that uh, when we start talking about um, adaptive immunity. Um, so any pathogen that ends up getting trapped uh, in any of these nodes is going to encounter leukocytes and dendritic cells. Uh, so these guys are going to eliminate the threats. Um, and I'll talk about some of these processes in, um, in one of the, the future lectures, I think. Uh, I'm not sure if it's in this one. Uh, but anyway, once this lymph is cleaned, uh, the pathogens are drained out through the efferent lymphatic vessels. Again, these are going out. Um, and again, lymph nodes, they do trap about 90%. So very few things... Um, get out of the system. Again, once it makes it to the blood, then um, you do have white blood cells that are roaming around too. And you also have the natural killer cells, the NK cells, um, which help you destroy things. But at the same time, um, they're, they're pretty efficient at doing their job. So again, here you have basically a map of everything and you have um, an image of more or less what that looks like. Okay, then you have your spleen. Um, this is the largest lymphoid organ in the body. It tends to be uh, lateral to the abdominal pelvic cavity, uh, usually pretty close to your stomach. Um, and it's two different types of cells in here. You have your red pulp and your white pulp. Uh, the red pulp is typically um, old erythrocytes, so old red blood cells that need to be destroyed. Again, the spleen is responsible for managing that. Uh, we have talked about that already. Um, and then you also have your white pulp. So this is um, pathogens from the blood and leukocytes and dendritic cells that have all been collected or are going to start making their way out. And again, here you have an image of what that looks like and where its position is anatomically. The thymus. So the thymus is kind of the, one of the more important ones, um, mainly because of its... Uh, hormone uh, regulation functions and not only that it's also responsible for uh, maturing t cells uh, again your helper and your cytotoxic t cells they come uh, from the thymus or they mature in the thymus um, when you're very very little as as a child uh, the thymus is actually very active so it it's huge um, and again around the ages of 12 to 14 is when it gets about the biggest it's going to be but and as you get older of course this thymus starts getting uh, degraded some of that tissue starts getting replaced uh, with different types of fatty tissues and things like that so again when you're when you're younger you tend to have a better immune system um, so again after 14 15 years of age you start having some atrophy 
in the area. So again, um, so by the age of 65 to 70, you're going to have about 2% of the initial uh, T cell production that you had when you were a child. Um, so the adult thymus is mainly uh, these little lobules or corpuscles, which are kind of little lumps on the surface of the thymus. And I'll show you an image of what that looks like um, in a little bit. So each one of those lobules has an outer cortex, just like um, most of the nodes and a medulla on the inside. Um, the cortex has a lot of T cells. Um, and the medulla, it has less of that, um, but it's mainly um, used for the destruction of, um, of some cells that could react to your own body. So there's, uh, there's the concept of self, and then there's a concept of foreign. So if your T cells are responding to your self cells, then that means that they're no good and they should be destroyed. Uh, so they are destroyed and that's kind of where it happens. But if they're not self identifying or if they are like a self identifying and they don't destroy yourself, then they're good to go through the rest of your body. So again, the medulla in this case is meant to destroy things that don't know that the body they're attacking is its own. So again, if it's, if it recognizes itself, then it goes out to the body. If it doesn't recognize itself, if it were to go out, it would start attacking your body. And that's when you start having issues with um, autoimmune disorders because those cells don't recognize that it's your own cells, if that makes sense. Uh, there are no uh, lymphoid follicles in the thymus, um, so you're not going to see any B cells there. Again, this is an image of what that looks like. Again, you have adipose tissue throughout. And again, as you get older, a lot of this area get, does get replaced by some of that fatty tissue. All right, so let's do a quick overview of the of the immune system. Again, I'm going to go over adaptive immunity in, in, in another lecture. But your first line of defense is your skin and your mucous membranes that are surface barriers. So anything that's trying to come in has to damage some of those systems in order to to enter your body. Uh, so whenever you get a cut um, and you go to the nurse because you're bleeding, she just tells you, oh, just wash it off with soap and water and gives you a Band-Aid. Again, because the skin has been broken, uh, there is a very good uh, or there is a high probability that something is going to go in there. Uh, so by washing it, you're disinfecting the area. And by putting a Band-Aid over it, you're actually blocking any of the environmental things from going into that wound which is good uh, because if you have things going in there, it's going to lead to inflammation, which means that uh, you're probably going to have a lot more tissue damage and it's going to take a little bit longer to heal versus if you clean it, disinfect it, and then cover it, you're less likely to get any complications or an infection that can uh, lead to a longer time of, of, uh, of recovery. I, I know sometimes a little cut is, is not that big a deal, but um, if you really think about it, uh, you can get very, very sick by just having a little cut, especially if you live in places like, you know, um, a jungle or a, a rainforest where things are very humid and there's a lot of things everywhere. Um, second line of defense, this is what makes up uh, your innate immunity. So this is immunity that comes from uh, a couple of things. And this is when we start having the concept of an APC, an antigen presenting cell. So, um, there's also a ton of proteins that are circulating through your bloodstream and your plasma, and those are very important. And I'll talk about some of the some of the important ones like uh, C3 um, and the pathway that that C3 does and how it's how it's important for your body. And lastly, your third line of defense. These are uh, cells and proteins that of, of adaptive immunity. And that's kind of where it starts getting a little bit more complicated, but again, not, not impossible. Uh, so let's talk about nonspecific immunity first. Um, so depending on what type of uh, injury or pathogen you have, uh, your body's going to respond to it a little bit differently. Uh, the first thing that it's going to do is uh, it's going to do a nonspecific pathway. So every pathogen or class of pathogen that goes into your body gets treated the same way by your innate immune system. Um, so you're going to have antimicrobial proteins uh, that are going to respond really quickly. And these are going to work within a couple of hours. Again, you have a few minutes before your body starts to respond to any type of, of injury. Um, so like if you get a little cut, maybe at the beginning it doesn't hurt, but then a couple minutes later, you're going to start feeling a little bit of pain. Um, 
So again, even when you're not being stimulated, even if there's uh, no inflammation yet, your body already has some of these features, some of those proteins circulating through your system. Um, so let's say that you were exposed to the flu, for example, and you got a vaccine for it. This is where adaptive or specific immunity would kick in um, because that vaccine, it had some very specific markers. Uh, so when you get, for example, the, the flu vaccine, what you're doing is you're exposing, um, you're exposing your immune system to antigens. So those antigens at some point are going to bind to an antibody. So in the case of your immune system, your immune system is going to make something that matches this antigen. So that little antibody, whenever it finds that antigen, it's going to bind to that antigen. A cell is going to see, hey, this antibody was bound. It's going to send a signal to memory B cells to make tons of these. So basically, there's someone or there's a cell that remembers the infection. And that's why B cells are so important. So those B cells remember infections. They remember antigens. So if this goes in there, boop, it's going to get basically phagocytized. So it's going to be brought in. Then it's going to make an antigen presenting cell. That antigen presenting cell is going to activate B cells. I'm sorry, my pen's not doing a very good job today. And then once those B cells become active, they're going to shoot out a bunch of those things. Boop. These. So it's going to make tons of them. So again, this B cell, it was alive when you got the flu shot. So because it was alive when you got the flu shot, it remembers it. So again, this reactivation right here uh, leads to the making of antibodies. Uh, but this is the thing. This is a very specific antibody. So this antibody is going to act on the antigen that is being presented by this cell. Okay. So that cell is specific to whatever antibody it bound to. So again, this is, uh, I know right now it's very an abstract concept, but just remember that adaptive immunity is very, very specific. You have this one pathogen that you are trying to get rid of. Okay. Innate immunity or non-specific immunity is more of, Hey, well, if anything happens, you know, we're ready to go. That's your front line. Um, so there's two types of immunity. Um, and the first is a uh, cell mediated immunity, which is brought to you by T cells. So again, you have your T helper cells that activate your cytotoxic toxic T cells and those cytotoxic T cells kill. Okay. The antibody mediated immunity, uh, the B cells send antibodies and those antibodies activate mechanisms to kill. Uh, again, a bunch of different ones. So what this is going to do, boop, it's going to block and then boop, these guys are going to go around that route. Uh, so again, adaptive immunity, it's a lot slower. Uh, it takes a couple of days for that to mount. Um, so again, about three to five days is about the response versus your innate immunity uh, takes into effect maybe four to six minutes. Uh, it relies on memory, of course, uh, but again, not brain memory, but B cell memory. We also call them plasma cells. Um, yeah, so every time you get um, exposed to that, then, you know, your, your body reacts a certain way. Um, and this is kind of how a lot of vaccines got, uh, or the, the first vaccine started to come, to come out. Um, so you have this disease called smallpox and killed a lot of people, right? Uh, but the people that it didn't kill were milkmaids. I know like milkmaids like now are like, what's a milkmaid? 
So people had these ladies that would basically milk their cows and then they would bring milk uh, to the house. Um, and yeah, like somebody brought you your, your milk. Uh, but what happened with these milkmaids is that they were cows that were sick. Um, they had cows pox. Okay. So they were exposed to this cows pox all the time. Uh, and at some point, the virus jumped from a cow to a human because of that exposure, constant exposure. So what happens here is that because the milkmaids were exposed, and let's make, let's make that virus look like that. Okay. Milkmaids were exposed to the cow's pox. So their immune system had identified this little piece right here. Okay. So whenever uh, smallpox came around, it was very, very similar to cowspox, almost, almost identical. So what ended up happening is because the milkmaids had already been exposed, that meant That they had immunity to that disease. So milk, milkmaids that were exposed to cows that had cows pox were immune to smallpox. Uh, why? Because the antigens that these guys had were already remembered by the immune system of those milkmaids. So the milkmaids immune system had some B cells that said, hey, I remember this. So then it started mounting the army of antibodies. And the way it does it is once a B cell sees an infection again, it starts replicating itself. It starts making copies of itself again and again and again and again. And each one of those cells is going to shoot out antibodies throughout your body because as these circulate through your circulatory system, it's going to get picked up by a cell. And then the cells that pick them up are usually your T cells. So then your T cells are going to bind to those um, viruses that have the antibody on them and they're going to phagocytize them. So they're going to destroy them. And that's how this type of immunity works. So again, it's not independent uh, of anything. Uh, these systems rely on each other uh, for the most part. So again, uh, you have to have things circling around to identify that that antibody has been bound at the same time, anything that's an APC cell has to go talk to the B cell to get it to, to replicate. So they all need to be able to communicate with one another because if they don't, the immune response is not mounted. And again, if you don't have a, a good immune response, uh, that means uh, you're gonna die. So let's talk about surface barriers. Um, again, your skin is, um, because of its extracellular matrix and the high, um, I guess, composition of collagen, you have quite a bit of flexibility with the skin. So you do have a little bit of uh, resistance to mechanical stress. Um, and again, because they're characterized dead skin cells on the surface of your skin, uh, you tend to have a little bit of, of, a, of protection against piercing. Um, you also have these sebaceous glands, which secrete oil or sebum. Uh, and it's especially noticeable like around the face, your nose area, or what they call the T-zone of the face. Um, and what's really good about it is it has a really acidic pH, or actually a slightly acidic pH, sorry. Um, so what happens is because of that acidity, uh, some organisms don't like that. So it ends up killing anything that ends up there. Uh, of course, I was talking about mucous membranes before. Uh, these mucous membranes, they don't have keratin, so they're, you know, less resistant. So you can damage them with a tortilla chip while you're eating Doritos for lunch or something like that. Uh, but it's sticky um, and it secretes things that help prevent uh, pathogen invasion. Uh, and it's also important for trapping debris and trapping uh, bacteria or anything like that. Uh, in your stomach, uh, this membrane actually secretes acid that helps uh, kill any pathogens that you may have ingested. Again, it doesn't kill everything because some things are resistant to acidic environments, but you know, if it's not, it tends to destroy it pretty well. 
um, certain species of bacteria, things like uh, Clostridium and uh, a couple of others, um, they actually um, have these mechanisms to avoid some of those defenses. Uh, so some of them, like that Clostridium, it actually produces collagenase, which is an enzyme that destroys collagen. Um, so once it destroys that collagen, it's able to go deeper into your skin. Um, and it even can have access to skeletal muscle, which uh, can eventually lead to necrosis or death of, of tissue. Um, so as some of these bacteria destroy the, the tissues, um, they produce gas. Um, so, you know, you sometimes can develop a gas, gangrene. Um, and then to make things worse, uh, these enzymes destroy any neutrophils um, that are found in the area. So what it does is like it doesn't let your body mount a proper immune system because, again, these neutrophils are also responsible for recruiting other cells. Um, some fungi actually are also resistant to, to phagocytosis. Uh, so again, some uh, yeast cells actually can cause things like blastomytosis, which are um, which is what happens when when they develop really really thick walls. So once they're ingested, really nothing could be done to those cells. Um, and again, if these things get into your lungs, uh, you could have some pretty severe uh, some pretty severe effects. Um, and again, fungal infections are, are sometimes very, very hard to, to treat and they spread quite easily. Um, again, because they cannot be destroyed that, that easily. Um, there's a couple of other things like some, um, some pathogens uh, that can tolerate acidic pHs like the polio. Um, so again, even if you're... Um, if your stomach has a little, a really, really high acidic pH, uh, the polio virus can survive there. Um, so, I mean, thankfully we have vaccines. Uh, another one that is really, really bad is Helicobacter pylori, and I've had this infection uh, several times. So it really likes acidic environments, and what it does is it likes to bury itself in the lining of your stomach, and then it'll digest that, and then once it's done with that lining, it goes into the wall of your stomach, and it starts causing uh, ulcers. So again, it's really, really dangerous and it's highly resistant. It's really hard to get rid of. Um, so some cells that are important uh, to continue kind of with uh, adaptive immunity um, are things like granulocytes, mainly B and T lymphocytes, um, and some granulocytes like neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. Uh, again, many of these cells, they're really important because they become phagocytes. And what that does is, all it does is it takes them in um, and it digests them inside. You have other types of leukocytes that are really also important for immunity, uh, which are uh, your NK cells, natural killer cells. Uh, these are in your blood, they're in your spleen, and they're mainly uh, working in innate immunity. And why the reason these guys are so cool is they can actually detect um, sometimes cancerous cells and also they can detect um, cells that are infected by a virus and they can destroy it um, you also have dendritic cells that are found everywhere um, and their main role is to activate t cells okay so all they're doing do you have like a little cell right and it's taken in something so it becomes an antigen presenting cell. So it makes its way to a T cell and this T cell recognizes that. Let's make it green. So boop, it becomes active. So then once that T helper cell is active, it activates a cytotoxic T cell. So now this cytotoxic T cell is gonna go find that antigen and destroy it. Okay, that's not a cell anymore, sorry. Anyway, um, 
Antibodies, of course, like I mentioned before, are produced by B cells and their main role is uh, adaptive immunity and getting some of those antibodies out there. Um, and kind of getting into what's uh, happening with coronavirus is they're starting to do antibody studies. Um, and the reason they're doing these antibody studies is they're trying to figure out if you have the antibodies so that it, you're basically immune to coronavirus. Uh, and if you are immune, you know, you're at less of a risk. So like, for example, if you're a frontline worker and they have to prioritize people that are not you know, getting sick with some equipment, um, then maybe, I don't know, um, you would be uh, less of a risk of infection. Uh, versus somebody who doesn't have that, you know, uh, they'd be more susceptible to the disease. So again, an antibodies are important. Uh, again, like let's say you were exposed to HIV, but you just happen to make the antibody for HIV. Um, again, you have a ton of antibodies floating through your system right now. If one of those happens to be uh, able to recognize HIV, uh, you would not get H you would not get HIV if you were exposed to it. Um, Anyway, you also have complement systems, which is part of your innate immunity. And these complement systems are really important for activating a bunch of different pathways. And again, these pathways are all activating different parts of the immune system that is meant that are meant to do different roles. And then of course you have cytokines, um, which are usually um, important for regulating the activity of, of most of your immune cells. Uh, but again, they have a ton of different effects. Uh, your lymphatic and immune system, um, they work together. Uh, again, your lymphoid organs and tissues, they provide somewhere for the cells of the immune system to go and the organs and tissues help trap some things for the immune system. So if they're recognized in the lymphatic tissues, then um, they can begin to mount a, an immune response a lot faster. Uh, again, your lymphatic organs, they activate some of those cells, uh, mainly B and T cells. Again, the thymus is really important because you will not generate T cells if it's, or you will not have mature uh, T cells if it weren't for the thymus. Again, it's a really, really big deal for the adaptive immunity than innate immunity uh, because those B cells, they actually reside within that lymphatic system. So it's only when they're activated that they come out and they start producing some of those copies and then antibodies. Um, so let's talk about some of the internal defenses. Um, cells that mediate immunity um, or cells, cells of innate immunity uh, are basically the second line of defense. So they've penetrated the skin, they've managed to get across the mucus layer, and now they're beginning to replicate and cause damage to cells. Um, you have some molecules or some proteins that are circulating through your system, like I mentioned before, called uh, again, other than antibodies, known as the antimicrobial molecules. And these proteins, uh, they're going to start to activate things as soon as they sense something is, is on. Um, so there are some things that have to happen for those things to be active, and, and I'll kind of go through the process. Uh, and of course, they're divided into two types. You have your phagocytic and your non-phagocytic. Uh, your phagocytic cells are the ones that take in things and digest them. Uh, macrophages, neutrophils, xenophils, they're all phagocytes because they ingest, so they encapsulate, absorb, and destroy. Um, some granulocytes and agranulocytes can function of these as phagocytes, uh, but agranulocytes are typically, uh, we, we call them the monocytes, and, and they exit that bloodstream, and they basically go and they live in all of your tissues. Uh, where they develop into macrophages. So again, if something were to break your skin and your mucous membranes, uh, these monocytes that have made their way or made their home into all of your tissues, like all over your skin and um, your legs, your, your face, uh, they become macrophages. So they have the ability to ingest uh, anything foreign. Um, they become activated by a, a bunch of different things. But again, the first thing that happens if your body becomes damaged or you have some type of break in your skin is you have the activation of those macrophages. So they are the first, because they live there, they live in all the types of tissue in your body, they are the first to respond. So they ingest something, and once things are inside it, uh, they can use hydrogen peroxide or hypochlorous acid, which are some of the components found in bleach, and they'll start to grade whatever was there, okay? 
Uh, some cytotoxic effects uh, can also be secreted onto some of these pathogens that are too big for um, any macrophage to ingest. So now, instead of um, engulfing the whole thing, they're going to act as antigen-presenting cells. So basically, here is the antigen. I am presenting it to the immune system. That's really what they're doing. Uh, so once they present that, basically, uh, they're going to activate other cells that are going to start secreting things to increase the activity of some of these macrophages. So these are this is an example of a positive loop. So, okay, I'm being attacked by this thing. I need reinforcements. Oh, there's more of you? Okay, let's send more reinforcements. And they continue to send things, uh, and then at some point it's going to get turned off, of course. Uh, neutrophils, uh, they are the most numerous granulocytes uh, throughout your body. They're really, really good as phagocytes. Um, and again, they can take in just about anything. Uh, not only that, but they also are really um, cool because they can release some of these... Uh, um, some of these cytotoxic chemicals uh, and basically damage the plasma membrane of a pathogen. Um, again, they're typically in your bloodstream, but they have to be recruited uh, by chemotaxis. So if you don't have chemical messengers to recruit neutrophils, um, this process isn't going to take place. They're going to keep um, being in the, in the bloodstream. Uh, dendritic cells, they're very similar to macrophages and they also function as APCs. Um, but again, they, they're responsible for presenting some of those uh, T cells to, um, or presenting some of those antigens uh, to your T cells, and then they activate them. Uh, xenophils, of course, like we've mentioned before, um, they go to the areas as they are needed, and they're more associated with pathogens, uh, or sorry, parasites. Um, and what they do is they basically launch these little chemicals on top of the uh, parasites um, and they start basically making holes in them and then other immune cells can come in and, and help destroy. So other cells of innate immunity, um, again your NK cells, your natural killer cells, they're non-phagocytic, um, but again they, they're, they're cytotoxic. So what they do is they're going to release some cytokines and what cytokines are, they're just chemical compounds um, that's going to activate some macrophages and enhance the ability of those cells to get picked up. Um, basophils, of course, they're uh, granulocytes uh, and they have things that help uh, inflammation. So again, basophils are really important because they're very important recruiters. Um, they'll help other cells get to the site of injury uh, or infection. They're typically in your blood and they're also found in mast cells. Uh, which are in your mucous membranes, and they're basically it's a combination effect of the basophils that are recruited from your bloodstream and those that are in your mucous membranes that are uh, triggering inflammation. Um, so again, those antimicrobial proteins that I was talking about, uh, we call them complements. So there's a, more than than 20 plasma proteins, uh, mainly made by your liver, that help make up the complement system. Um, and again, those are typically uh, I guess pre-named with a C, and they're really important for both innate and adaptive immunity. Uh, so you have three different pathways for these complements. You have the classical pathway, uh, which basically happens when there is a protein binding to the antibodies that are bound to the antigen. So this one begins whenever an antibody attacks an, an antigen. So there is something dangerous floating through your system, uh, but you luckily have the antibody that recognizes it as foreign or as bad. So once those two bind, that's when the classical pathway activates and you have a complement protein attaching to it. And there's a couple of reasons why you would want that. Um, first, of course, is you want to tell the immune system what to pick up and destroy, and that's one way to do it. But also, you want to make sure that these blocked off pathogens don't create a blockage or a cluster or anything like that. So you want to get rid of them as you go. You want to make sure that everything is clear. And the classical pathway lets you do that. You also have the lectin pathway, uh, which is basically these little proteins that we call lectins. They're going to bind to carbohydrates on the surface of microbes. So, you know, the glycoproteins that are found on every cell, those lectin pathways like to bind to that. And again, it's really just enhancing um, what your immune system is doing. 
Of course, you also have the alternative pathway, which is, um, let's say that a foreign bacteria cell enters your body, it immediately binds to it so that it gets picked up. Um, two of these pathways are gonna uh, basically converge uh, and they're gonna activate or cleave the C3 uh, complement. So C3 is made of two subunits, uh, unit A and unit B. Unit A is inhibiting uh, unit B from working. So whenever this pathway becomes activated, C3, again, I'll draw it like a little, boop. so this is C3. This green part right here, that is C3A. And this red part is C3B. This one is active and this one is inhibitory. So whenever this C3 gets cleaved or gets cut, the inhibitory mechanism that's protecting uh, this protein from being active now goes away and it becomes active. So now it's gonna start doing whatever it needs to do. So once C3B is activated, and again, C3B is kind of an intermediate for a lot of different reactions um, or pathways, but once C3B becomes active, then that goes and it activates protein C5. Again, C5 is the same thing. You have a C5A and a C5B. Once C5B is basically separated from the A part, it now becomes active too. So again, here we have the different pathways. Again, classical pathway, you have an antigen that is bound to a pathogen. So the complement protein is gonna to bind to it. Then that's going to basically release uh, some enzymes that's gonna activate C3B, okay? Then you have the lectin protein binding to a microbe. Again, this is now identified glycoproteins that are foreign, and it's gonna activate C3B. And then of course, let's say you have an alternative pathway, there's a spontaneous separation of C3B and it's gonna activate uh, C3B. Uh, once those um, complement proteins are, are active, uh, some of them are gonna start triggering cell lysis or POP. So what this does is C3B is going to, is going to activate C5B and with C5B, boop, let's draw a cell, So that's a bad bacteria cell. So what C5B is gonna do, it's going to attach there, 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 and there. So once that C5B has bound to the surface of that bacteria cell, you are going to have the formation of what it's, what's known as a membrane attack complex or a MAC. So little proteins are gonna now start flying to those sites where you have C5B and they are going to insert themselves into this, the membrane of that cell and they're going to cause holes to form. Once those holes form, they're going to basically make the cell pop by exposing it to the osmotic pressure of your body. So when your body has a lot of salt. Okay, so once those bacteria cells are exposed to your environment, they're going to explode. And that is how some of those antimicrobial proteins can directly kill pathogens. Oh, that, I forgot there was a picture there. But anyway, yeah, the, the antimicrobial protein is gonna bind. Uh, some of those proteins are gonna go to that site and then they're going to cause the cell to, to lice or to die. Um, they're also really important for enhancing inflammation because inflammation is another uh, form of recruitment of cells and they're also able to neutralize viruses so C3B and the components of that complex that I was talking about, the MAC complex, they can bind to viruses and neutralize them. So this is a little, that's the little protein that the virus is using to infect the cells, right? However, if you have one of those micro uh, antimicrobial proteins, it's going to be incapable of binding to a host cell. So once it does that, then you have your macrophages, boop. It's gonna come in 
it's going to phagocytize it, and then it's going to destroy it. And it did its job. So again, those complement proteins in this case are activating some basophils. The basophils are increasing inflammatory mediators, which are going to recruit all the other different types of immune cells to go to the site of injury or infection. Or again, in the case of viruses, those C3B uh, antimicrobial proteins are going to bind to the surface of the virus and they're going to neutralize it. Once it becomes neutralized, it's going to be phagocytized and destroyed. Uh, again, that phagocytizing is really important. Uh, so again, opsonization is the process of, um, of making uh, phagocytes bind more strongly to these pathogens. So basically, it's just making it more efficient. It's, it's clearly marking things for destruction. Um, again, you also have a lot of immune complexes um, that are basically antigens that are bound to antibodies. And again, you don't want to have them there. So it clears these from circulation. Um, so you don't want any of these viral or pathogenic um, organisms or chunks of organisms uh, clumping around anywhere. So again, it helps clear that from your system. And again, here you have an enhancing uh, of that uptake through opsonization. And here you have clearance of complexes. Again, uh, it's really important that you uh, leave these things um, out of your system and the, the faster you can get them out, the better. So here we have the different pathways of um, how some of those complements work. Uh, so again, just make sure you know and review these. Uh, in terms of cytokines, again, uh, cytokines are just proteins that are produced by different types of immune cells. Um, one of those is TNF or tumor necrosis factor. And this is uh, secreted by macrophages that have become active. And what it does is it basically calls phagocytes to go to the area uh, to clear any pathogen or damaged cell that is there. They're also going to increase uh, the number of phagocytes uh, that are active and they're going to release some of them to release more of themselves uh, to maintain a positive feedback loop until the threat is, is destroyed. Uh, you also have interferons, which are cytokines that are made by macrophages, dendritic cells, natural killer cells, and any adaptive immunity cell. And what they're going to do is they're going to enter the cell and they're going to inhibit viral replication. So they're going to interfere with the replication of the virus inside of the cell. And then you have the ones that will give you nightmares, which are interleukins. Um, there's 29 interleukins uh, known to date, and they're responsible for stimulating the production of neutrophils, uh, natural killer cells, trigger the production of interferons, and also activate T cells. So not only that, um, they're also responsible for um, inducing some of the symptoms that are going to help your body try to fight off this in, uh, the infection naturally. Uh, so the inflammatory responses that are triggered by some of these uh, interleukins and, and, um, and other cells, um, they tend to happen when you damage a cell or trauma or an infection or a toxin or a chemical or anything that can lead to inflammation. So again, basophils are going to release uh, inflammatory mediators, which are going to basically make the area swell. So phagocytes are going to get to the scene. They're going to clean up any damaged tissue or any pathogens, destroy them. Um, so the first part of these mediators is the tissue has to basically um, be damaged in order to release some of those factors. Um, so once they're there, um, these inflammatory mediators that are released, it could be anything from histamine to serotonin, uh, other cytokines, uh, bradykins, prostaglandins, and leukotrins, and all of these are going to help um, the area swell. And there's a couple of reasons why uh, why they do that. Uh, again, all of these complement proteins that I was talking about, they're also going to help release uh, some of those inflammatory mediators by activating the basophils. Um, so again, the area at some point is going to get red, swollen, it's going to feel warm, and it's going to hurt. Um, so those are, uh, or these four are the cardinal signs of inflammation. So redness, heat, swelling, and pain. Uh, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to get vasodilation. Uh, so what happens is your blood vessels are going to get a lot bigger. So because they're bigger, 
they're going to become two things. One is they're going to have a lot more blood, and two, they're going to become leaky. So vessels um, that are vasodilated allow white blood cells to squeeze through the gaps. And once they're there, um, they're going to help uh, fight off the infection or repair the damage, of course. Okay, um, so some um, proteins that are secreted um, are some of those that are also, um, if you remember clotting, uh, some of the important chemicals like um, fibrinogen, which are basically complement proteins, um, that are going to start clotting the area in, in the case of, of uh, breaking of, of vessels or anything like that. Pain. So pain is uh, one of the symptoms, again, of, of inflammation. Uh, and the reason why this happens is uh, you have the secretion or the activation of the bradykinin and other uh, proteins like prostaglandins. And what these are going to do is they're going to, um, they're going to, I guess, overexcite your neurons or your, your, um, the cells that are responsible for, for sensing in this case. And because you're firing so much, uh, it gives you the sensation of pain. Uh, but it's actually a protective function because it basically tells you three things. One is that it's damaged. Uh, two is that uh, it probably have some type of loss of function. And it also uh, allows your body to repair itself because you're not touching the area. You're not uh, damaging it any further. Um, again, um, it's also really important for these inflammatory mediators to be able to recruit leukocytes. Um, again, through the process of chemotaxis, which is chemical uh, signals. Um, if these things are not activated, uh, then it's really hard for your body to repair that. So let's take a look at it here. So you have some tissue damage. So you have a splinter. Uh, the first ones that are there are going to be the mast cells. And those mast cells uh, are eventually um, going to develop into macrophages. Those macrophages are going to you know, destroy the damaged cells and they're going to release inflammatory mediators. Um, and of course, once that inflammation begins, um, those inflammatory mediators are also going to start recruiting other things. Um, so again, as your blood vessels dilate, um, you're going to basically have a little bit of swelling, a little bit of redness. You're going to have the generation of actin potentials that are going to uh, stimulate pain. And you're also going to recruit all other kinds of cells like monocytes and neutrophils. Uh, the phagocyte response is the second part. So once things arrive there, then they're going to be doing uh, whatever their role is. So again, any local macrophages that are there, again, within a couple of minutes, they're going to start uh, phagocytizing pathogens and damaged cells. But again, only the ones that are here within the first couple of hours are going to do that. Um, so again, they're trying to contain the pathogen. Uh, once that um, chemotaxis begins, you're going to have neutrophils coming in. Again, in a couple of hours, um, they're going to migrate to their area. They're going to release inflammatory mediators, and you know they're going to try to, to make the area sticky so that you know you have uh, some of those neutrophils kind of sticking around there for a little bit. Um, you're also going to have, uh, again, more space between uh, the blood vessels so that things can squeeze through, uh, destroy bacteria, debris, or anything else. Uh, and then, of course, the bone marrow, because you've been damaged, they're going to release more neutrophils into the blood. Uh, so again, over time, uh, and again, this may take a couple of days, you're going to have uh, a rise in, in neutrophils. Uh, these monocytes that are there are going to become macrophages. They're going to phagocytize anything that's been damaged or anything foreign. Uh, and then you're also going to have cytokines, uh, which are going to get produced to increase your, your neutrophils and your monocytes. Um, and that's going to lead to leukocytosis. So whenever you have some type of infection that requires your body to, to fight it off or you have some pathogens there, uh, you can usually tell um, because you are going to have an increased uh, uh, white blood cell count. Um, whenever you have a lot of dead leukocytes, um, dead tissue cells and fluids, uh, they make a pus, and then that pus, of course, is white, and it, it oozes, or uh, sometimes it can become hardened uh, in the form of a cyst. Um, so again, after those macrophages come around, they're going to destroy any pathogens. Uh, neutrophils are going to start becoming active. Uh, they're going to squeeze through those gaps in between the blood vessels, um, 
and then of course you have uh, the bone marrow increasing some of those cells so that they can go back and uh, um, and help contain that infection. Like I had mentioned before, pain is one of the side effects of inflammation, um, and this is called by um, it's caused by prostaglandins and leukotrienes, uh, and the way they get there is. Uh, Cyclooxygenases and lipooxygenases are the enzymes responsible for producing these two uh, chemical compounds that lead to that pain. So ibuprofen, it's known as a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug or an NSAID drug, um, and they work by inhibiting some of those enzymes so that you don't have things like pro uh, prostaglandins, which are basically leading to, to more pain. You also have corticosteroids, uh, which is a second group of medication that is still an anti-inflammatory, but this is now a steroid. Uh, it's a lot stronger, um, but it's usually because the leukotrins that are there, usually for like from like allergies or, or anything more like that, like severe inflammation, um, that you would be prescribed some of those to help with a with a swelling. Um, so, for example, if you go to the doctor and you have a very severe uh, pharyngitis or something like that. Um, and it's uh, viral, what they'll sometimes do is they'll give you uh, prednisone or uh, a similar drug to try to help uh, the swelling so that uh, some of the swelling in your throat can go down. Fever. Uh, so fever is when your temperature is above the normal range uh, and anyone who has fever is referred to as uh, febrile. From a clinical perspective, fever is a sign that there is inflammation somewhere in the body. Um, fever is an innate response and it's caused by some chemicals called pyrogens. And these are released by any damaged cell or some types of bacteria. Uh, so what these pyrogens do is they influence the hypothalamus. And basically what they do is they reset your hypothalamus at a higher temperature. Uh, again, usually your body's thermostat is pretty stable, but uh, it works as a negative feedback loop. You start getting too hot, you start to sweat, vasodilate, you start getting too cold, and you start to shiver to try to bring up your body temperature. Um, so again, once your hypothalamic thermostat is reset higher because of the pyrogens, um, it's going to think your normal body temperature is cold. Again, because your threshold is now higher. So what's going to happen is you're going to feel cold and you're going to have chills, uh, which is basically, um, or you're, you're going to start to shiver because your body thinks it's cold, uh, even though you may be at a normal temperature. Um, so as soon as you start feeling cold, your body starts to shiver, you start generating more heat and your body goes higher until you reach that certain temperature. Um, so whenever fevers break, it's because your hypothalamus is reset at a lower temperature, which is more normal. Uh, so again, when you're really, really hot and uh, that you just had fever, uh, but it's starting to break, uh, your skin usually gets a little bit uh, flush. Uh, you start to sweat a little bit. Your blood vessels are dilated. Blood pressure may drop a little bit. Uh, but again, these are all things to try to lower your temperature again. Uh, fever is natural. It's trying to kill off uh, any pathogen that uh, may be sensible to temperature. Uh, and again, these are the different lines of defenses and their function. Uh, please make sure you go over them uh, for this lecture.